My man, Mikhail, I appreciate you so much for being on the show with me today. As I, as I go through the list of, of who I'm asking on the show and when I'm asking them on the show, I don't know why it took me so long to get to be part of it. <laughs> But you're a busy man, and I know you've been you've been doing a lot of stuff lately. So I definitely wanted to respect that. But it's it's time, my friend. It's time. Hey, it's no time like the present, man. So I'm glad we got to this point. <laughs> I love it. So why don't you know? For you and I have known each other for many a years now, and we'll definitely get into that. But for listeners who don't know who you are, give us the condensed version of the the history and the who of Mikhail. Sure, sure. So uh, my name is Mikhail Moraine, first and foremost, <laughs> first and last name. Um, and man, born and raised in the city of Detroit. I am the third oldest of 13 siblings. So I come from a big family and grew up with a lot of chaos, you know, with all those different personalities, right? It's bound to happen. Um and a big part of my upbringing actually contributes to who I am today, right? So um, definitely appreciate that experience. And um, I'm a father. I recently had a baby girl uh, last October, and I'm super, super excited about that. And also I have a son, my firstborn. And, and of course, I'm, I'm married to a beautiful and supporting wife. So um, that's a high level overview of me without going into too much detail. I'm pretty sure we'll get into some more things as we continue this conversation. <laughs> and as, as, as listeners will be able to tell later on in the episode that some of the things you've shared, being a father coming from a big family makes a lot of your goals and a lot of your ambitions and a lot of what you've accomplished even more impressive in a lot of ways. Hi there. Coach Alex here from A-Team Fitness. Thanks for listening as I share incredible transformation stories directly from the source themselves, the individuals doing the work and seeing the results. We'll take a behind the curtain peek at the mental and physical changes that make for amazing transformation. I'm glad you're here. And after the episode, I hope you feel empowered to begin making some transformative changes of your own. Let's dive in. But before we get into that, I'm curious. I actually didn't know you had so many siblings. Yeah, man. <laughs> so you have 13 siblings or you're one of 13? I am um, one of 13. So 13 total. Correct. What, what's it like being in such a large family? Man, it's, uh, it's, it's a very interesting dynamic, you know, because... Um, some of those are on my mom's side, some are on my dad's side. And out of all my siblings, I'm the one who literally communicates with everybody. Wow. So it's um it's a it's an interesting thing, just kind of like balance with different personalities and keeping contact with people. But um, you know, it's a I love it. Honestly, I do. You know, as I I don't feel alone in this world because I know I always got a brother or sister or somebody <laughs> out there and people live in different states as well at this point. So, you know, I got places to visit from time yeah. to time. Yeah. That's awesome. I think back, you know, I have, I have three brothers, so there's four of us. Uh, I'm the second youngest. So my younger brother is much, much younger than the rest of us. He's about 12 years younger than me. My oldest brother is about four and a half years older than me. And then I have a brother who's a year older than me. So the three of us, the three older ones were much closer growing up. Like we had the same group of friends. We kind of uh, all hung out together and, and obviously came up together. And it's, I, I think, you know, when you said one of 13, immediately I went to, in my mind with two brothers at the time, how I had to, how we would fight for food. <laughs> not because we didn't have enough but just because we all wanted to eat it all yeah yeah i understand that <laughs> and it, very specifically and very oddly I, re I recall memories we would make or our mom would make those sugar-free pudding boxes you know what i'm talking about like uh, vanilla pudding or whatever yeah yeah and we'd make it in a little square tubware container and we had a little bit of an unspoken rule between the three of us where if that was ever made 
any one of us was only allowed to take a third of it. We had to split it a third. That's fair. And as pudding goes, as you know, a gelatinous mixture sitting in a Tupperware container, pretty confined. It's as you could imagine, it's pretty easy to draw very clear boundaries in it. Like you could take a third of it out of the container and it will still hold its shape and won't like right. fill in the third. So it became very obvious when someone went over their boundaries <laughs> a little bit. You know what I mean? And then there were going to yeah. be problems. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because the first person would take a little extra, the second person would get a little upset, and then they'd take a little extra, and then the third person got screwed. Oh, man. <laughs> and then we also had a rule in our house where, which I still, I will admit, I still enact with Katrina at home, which is if you had leftovers from like a restaurant meal or something, mm -hmm. you had 24 hours to finish it before it became fair game. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. You're so, a brave man. I dare not ever touch my wife's leftovers, no matter how long it's been, <laughs> without her permission. <laughs> brave, brave or stupid, we're still unsure which one. But then, oh, yeah. so, so, you know, it, you had to get on it, right? It wasn't, oh, I'm going to bring leftovers and then I'm going to make something else for dinner the next day and I'll get to the leftovers eventually. It was, no, the next meal you ate had to be your leftovers. <laughs> Or else somebody was snatching it out of the fridge. That's a lot of pressure, man. <laughs> Maybe it explains a lot of my mentality these days. Who knows? Possibly. Possibly. Very competitive food environment. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I want to, I mentioned early on that we've known each other for a very long time. I want to say we met in, was it 2017 or 2018? It know? was 2018. It was 2018. Okay. And so, uh, you, uh, how did we initially meet? No, wait, you know what? That is not true. We met in 2017. 2017. Wow. Yeah. We met in 2017. And so how we initially met was my team member, um, at the time was one of your clients. And it's so funny. I was listening to one of your episodes from another client you had, and it made it all come back to me like how this all started. And she, um, <clears throat> all of a sudden she came out of nowhere being top in the region in production. And of course you're going to take notice to who's doing really well, you know, and especially in a competitive sales environment. And then I noticed that she physically changed a lot. Now, I don't know if that was a direct correlation to, um, which one came first? Did her sex come first and then the fitness or did the fitness journey spark her to be so successful? Either way, I took notice. I asked her like, you know, hey, who you've been, what you've been working out with or whatever the case may be. She told me your name and number and it started from there. So uh, shout out to Brittany <laughs> for, for, for the, for the plug. A shout out for that. Absolutely. <laughs> I remember because the interesting thing about our relationship is we met in 2017 and I've seen you in person, I think, twice in that entire time. That is correct. The first consultation and at the Christmas party. The first consultation and at the Christmas party you came to. And uh, I still remember very specifically the first consultation where you came in because I was I was at the very first gym that I'd set up shop in. I've since been at two other gyms. And I remember I was running late that day. I remember seeing you, you had come straight from work, I believe, because you were dressed nicely. You came into the gym with your gym bag and it will kind of stand at the front. And I realized I was running late and I hate, I hate when that happens. Right. Because I <laughs> still want to leave you hanging, sitting there. Um, and, but sure enough, we got into it and, and we had the consultation and we had talked about doing the online coaching because obviously you were based out in Detroit at the time mm -hmm. and me being in Ann Arbor, that's a, a pretty hefty hike for a, a regular drive. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and unbeknownst maybe to you at the time, you were what actually one of my first online clients ever. Wow. I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. And so I think that gives you a unique, you might've been, if I put a specific number on, I think you were my third or fourth online okay. client ever. Yeah. And look where you're at today. <laughs> I, you know, I, I started online coaching in 2017. 
And, and then you came into the picture. So you've had a unique perspective because you and I have worked together on and off since then and always in an online capacity. So I think you might actually be the one person that has seen and experienced every iteration of my online coaching since its inception. Wow. Because I've completely revamped it maybe three or four times. Yeah, for it. sure. It's completely different from, from how it was in the beginning. And so if you can remember how it was in the beginning versus how it was the most recent time that you've been in the program, is there anything that stands out to you as being very different? The mobile app. Yeah. Um, it's definitely, you know, compared to then, it's definitely different. Um, we've upgraded that and that platform significantly. It's very, very user-friendly, very current. Um, and it's, a, it's an important tool when you're talking about an online coaching aspect. So um, that's something that's changed a lot. You know, I think that, constant communication via text, the weekly calls, that was always a staple, right? Um, I think those things that really make you and your program so successful, they haven't changed. It's just the bells and whistles that you that you use now to allow you to be more effective and, and help more and help more people have just enhanced, yeah. really. Yeah, but you are the difference here. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I'm going to take yeah. that sound bite. That's for sure. <laughs> um, you know, there's, as we're talking about it, I'm kind of thinking, I'm reflecting on my own journey through it. And I remember when I first started online coaching, I did it for a variety of reasons, many of which are still true. I wanted the, the freedom to be able to travel more. I wanted a little bit more flexibility of my time and not being attached to one physical location for such long periods of time. Uh, but at early on, I fell into the trap that a lot of coaches fall into when they get into online coaching, which I think I've talked about uh, in previous interviews that I've done, is a lot of coaches getting into online space fall into the trap of doing it to achieve this dream of like working less and automating things and kind of live in that laptop lifestyle of being on a beach somewhere with a mm -hmm. pina colada and their laptop and they're taking pictures for Instagram and working an hour. <laughs> right. And making all this money and just like living the dream. Right. And so that was reflected in the earlier iterations where it was obviously more bare bones. It was Google Google documents and, and regular emails and um, my desire to help people is still there, but there was definitely an emphasis in trying to figure out, okay, how can I remove myself from the process mm -hmm. to do it? And it wasn't until reflecting as years went on and I noticed there was more turnover than I would have liked of people come in, get pretty good results, but then they'd leave and they'd come and they'd get pretty good and they'd leave. And I realized that something wasn't quite right. You know what I mean? Like I had to yeah. figure out what that was. And then I started probably the iteration before it is now where it was, and you may remember this, there was what I called the premium coaching, which was everything I had to offer, which I think you were doing at the time. And then there was the a la carte version where people, there was like the basic package where they would just get workouts every four weeks and we check in via email once a week. And then they could add things that they wanted. If they wanted nutrition coaching, they could add it. If they wanted the strategy session calls, they could add it. If they wanted the daily communication, they could add it, but they didn't have to. Right. And I learned in observing that, that over time, my greatest turnover was people doing the out of the cart stuff because they would naturally gravitate towards the cheapest option, which was just doing the basic package, whether mm -hmm. they didn't believe they needed the other stuff or they convinced themselves that wouldn't be as helpful as, they, as it may have been in reality. They just yeah. did the most basic package, would get mediocre results as, as a product of that, and then would eventually leave and, and go find something else. And it was then reflecting on the people who were in the premium coaching program, like yourself and, and others who were getting the best results. They were crushing it. They were doing it, which, you know, I want to talk about that 60 day challenge here in a moment. And it made me realize like, okay, what was the difference here? Right. The people in this program versus the people doing the a la carte stuff. And mm -hmm. what I chalked it up to was getting everything that I had to offer, right. Not withholding anything else. And it was somebody else sent me a message who had won a free month of the online coaching, the premium package, 
where she had actually said to me in an email that the nutrition coaching was the most helpful for her, but she didn't originally think she would use it that much. And it was this realization of, okay, people may not know what's going to be most helpful for them. Yeah. In the moment. So if I give them the power to choose, they may not select the things that will actually make the biggest difference and then they won't get the best results. Yeah. hundred percent. And so seeing your progress and hearing that feedback from some of the others allowed me to transition into the current format, which is much simpler. It's if you sign on with me, there's one price and you get everything I have to offer. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I like that just because, you know, while you mentioned that one client, it was the nutrition aspect for, you know, for me, I always told you um, it was the additional accountability. Right. Um, that that's the main thing. So when, when we talk about people working out in fitness in a online type of um, environment, you have to be a go getter. You have to be a self starter really at the end of the day. And so, you know, that additional layer of accountability is, was huge for me um, and, and my journey and, and experiences with you. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's funny whenever I am talking to people about the program and I tell them, whether it's just somebody outside of the program, I tell them how it works and how I talk to clients every day or people who are interested and I tell them I'm going to be talking to you every day. A lot of people uh, are a little perplexed and thinking that that's a, a real thing, but I know you more than most can attest. <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when I say I'm going to reach out every day. <laughs> I, 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 it amazes me, honestly. You know, like, I'm like, how does he do this? And it's not like you send text messages and it's not like I'm in it's some group text and a bunch of people, you know, it comes to me individually. Of course, there's ways you can do that, but it's just like, man, like the, you must have so many conversations going like, I would love to see what your phone bill text message number is, you know, like, <laughs> because you're always communicating, which, which I love. So it's true. It's, you know, it's been, uh, it's been, uh, it's been a process in and of itself to figure out how to do that in an authentic way that wasn't just automated messages or anything like that, that was genuinely like a human being checking on you. Yeah, it's going through and, and it's in a pretty good place now, but it uh, it's something I don't think about too much anymore. How many conversations mm -hmm. I have every single day? You know? Yeah, uh, it has to be a lot, <laughs> a lot. But uh, the other interesting thing, of course, of you kind of going through the online coaching program throughout all of the different iterations is my then unique seat to see your personal growth through each of those stages yeah, in a couple of different ways. But one thing in particular that I want to talk about, if you recall that 60 day challenge you did at your local gym. Yes. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what that was and, and what kind of inspired you to do it. Sure. Sure. So, you know, that, that was a 60 day challenge for a lifetime and and I think they run them a few times a year, but I picked the most difficult one because this 60 day challenge happened to be in November and December. The, the times of year when we're eating the most and, you know, socializing the most where people typically let their health and fitness slip. And, you know, I'm an individual who likes to take on challenges, who likes to push himself. Um, if things are easy, I probably don't want it. You know, uh, you always find me doing some stuff to like, why you got to make things so complicated? You know, so um, it's it's uh, I did that six day challenge during that time period. And I actually I don't know if you recall this or not. You know, I, I was like, man, I don't know if I can can win this thing, you know, um, you know, because of you know, I looked at some of the, the competition as you know, I was registering in, in that time. And also just a challenging time of year. And. I end up actually coming out of the men's division number one. I, I if I recall, us twenty eight point two pounds and like twelve percent body fat over that sixty day time period. Like completely crushed them. So, um, but it was like, I mean, we were, you were on it though, man. You you had me my eating plan together. You know, we were tracking our meals day in and day out, hitting the gym every single day at four a.m. before work, and it was. Um, it was a very, very 
time of it was it was a time of really like it showed me what I was made of. Like I was capable of doing so much more. You know, um, I had a lot of stuff going on with work and of course at home. And I still made time for that. And during the holiday season, when I could have gave myself all these excuses on why, you know, or I could give myself a pass. Oh, it's Thanksgiving. Oh, it's Christmas. Oh, it's this and it's that. And, uh, you know, I stayed the course and um, I was I was very happy of what I accomplished during that 60 day time period, for sure. It was quite incredible, the feat that you had. While, of course, still being a father at home, still working a demanding job, doing all these things. And which, if I recall, was that the period of time where you were in the process of doing the credit repair? No, I still was actually working in the mortgage industry. You were still time. in the mortgage industry. So, yeah, probably so even working more 12 than hours a day. Yeah. <laughs> that's why i had to get to the gym at 4 a.m where it was a wrap because by the time i got home i was toast <laughs> and it's so you know it's incredible to think about you, you mentioned this idea of kind of seeing what you were capable of and seeing how far you could push yourself and how that translated into other areas which i think is such a unique and interesting idea because it really is one of the greatest skills we can learn and one of the biggest biggest benefits of fitness and pushing ourselves physically is right being able to walk up to what our self-perceived limitations are Mm -hmm. and then whether through a choice of our own and our own motivation or through the external motivation of a coach that we're working with or a friend or accountability buddy or whatever we realize we can go past that line a little bit there's more than we're capable You know, to all your listeners, to you, we are all capable of so much more than we think we are as individuals. Like, I don't think most of us really, really truly scratch the surface of what we can become, you know, so a lot of truth to that. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that I think has, as our relationship has continued to grow over the years that we've connected really a lot about is some of those central ideas of personal growth and ambition and achievement. And which has led to a lot of great conversations, you know, you and I now kind of will share reading materials back and forth. And we've had the opportunity to talk about some of these ideas, but uh, you know, you originally decided to, to come on as a client and, and get into a coaching program, seeing Brittany's achievements, both with her fitness and with her professional career. And so naturally that means that you had to have, had some ambitions of your own, right? You saw what kind of an edge it could give you and and you wanted to get a little bit of that for yourself. Tell us a little bit about just in general, kind of your trajectory professionally, your ambitions professionally, just like, who are you in that side of your life? Man, so... And that side of my life, I've always been a hard worker. You know, I really think it's, it stems from literally childhood. Um, I, I had a mom who was extremely hardworking. And so she set a, a strong example for me as far as when it comes to this hard work. And of course, you know, being one of 13, it's, uh, it's not always going to be easy, <laughs> especially growing up in the city of Detroit. So at that time, um, it was one of those things where I've always was told that I, if I wanted to have things, I had to work hard to get them, you know? So, I mean, I was the, I was the kid knocking on your door with the shovel when it's you know, snowing or raking your leaves in the fall and cutting your grass in the summer. Right. I, uh, in high school from 10th to 12th grade consistently every single day, I saw candy. Right. <laughs> and that gave me an idea um, it planted that seed of just really entrepreneurship and, um, you know, kind of creating and earning for myself. Um, and, and that kind of continued on into my professional endeavors where, you know, I, I've been in the career of sales. I love it. And, you know, just that opportunity to feel somewhat in control of the income that I make. And then eventually, you know, into entrepreneurship where I am uh, currently full in today. So. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's been a journey, but, you know, I would just say is this really a part of, you know, who I am and it's really just been ingrained in me. Is there um, are there particular changes in your mindset in general that you've noticed from childhood to college to where you are now 
in your life? Like, are there specific shifts in the way you think about yourself or you think about your career or you think about business that you've noticed? Oh, man. Yes. A lot. Right. You know, I could probably talk about that for hours, you know, just kind of really thinking about it. But I would say. Two biggest ones um, would be. You're good enough as you are today. I, I feel like I always really, really worked hard and tried hard as, as I, you know, really gotten and I really got down to like, why was I like that? It's because I I didn't feel like I was good enough. I really didn't, you know, and I struggled with that even as an adult. Like, I mean, I've accomplished some really, really good things. And on the outside looking in, people would never, never think that. But I, I never really felt like I was good enough. So I felt like I had to try harder, you know, than everybody else. Um, so I would just definitely change and, and really realize like, man, you're good enough where you're at. If you're doing your best, you're doing the best that you can where you're at. Of course, you want to grow. You want to get better in an overall sense. But I'm the best I can be at this very moment right now. Right. And so don't worry about anything else. Just go out and do your best and continue to do that. You know, and then and then the second thing would just be is the importance of habits, right? Proper habits. Um, I'm one of those guys who you could call me like kind of a visionary. I'm a big picture thinker. I have very, very good foresight. And sometimes I forget about the day-to-day -day things that actually get me there, right? And so I always have to remind myself to dial it in. And let's focus on those things that I need to do every single day that's ultimately going to get me to where I want to go. And so, you know, being confident in who you are and knowing that you're good enough and then just making sure that you are creating the right habits for your life so that way you can have the life that you want in the future has. Those are the two things I would say right now um, that are constantly I keep at the front of my front of my mind. Yeah. You know, <laughs> have changed over time for sure. And thinking of kind of the imposter syndrome that you're that you're referencing, right? This idea that we're not good enough for what we've accomplished, right? Or what we want yeah. to accomplish. It's 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 such an interesting phenomenon, right? Because it literally happens to everyone, unless you're a sociopath, right? <laughs> other than that, like ever because I know I have felt it and continue to feel it just the same as you. Mm -hmm. right? where I see how far my business has come from the early days back in 2014, when I started 18 fitness, 23 years old, green behind the ears, like had no idea anything around business whatsoever, had only been a trainer for a year. So I was still new to the industry, let alone being able to actually run a business about, you know, coaching. And so to see kind of the things that similarly that I've accomplished in that amount of time, it's, you know, sometimes it's easy to discount a lot of that stuff. Absolutely. Cause you know how much you don't know. And you like, do they know that I don't know? All this stuff? <laughs> and it's so interesting how it's, it's only at the moment when we start to realize how much we don't know that we can truly kind of step in to the power that we have within that particular field, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's 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 almost like at that point we know where the landmines are, so we know how to avoid them. Mhm. Mm right? Second thing is just the, the 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 importance of just having good habits, really. Which is something we talked habits. about, right? Atomic habits, the the book the Yeah, Dream, right? By James Clear. Yes, sir. Fantastic book. <clears throat> Uh, it, it reminds me too of, you know, I had to, I had to overcome when I first started my business, there was a lot of retraining myself in the sense that I had this kind of belief for myself that if I wasn't spending every spare moment on growing my business, then I didn't want it bad enough. Now that ultimately served me pretty well, whether that was healthy or not is an entirely different question. Right. Right. But it served me to the point of building a lot of habits where now upon and some of which I'm trying to break now upon waking up my first instinctual reaction is to head to the office, open the computer up, start getting stuff done. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's led, the power of habit has led, you know, something I've thought of a lot about over the years, obviously, because it's something I work with with people every day with their fitness habits, right? Mm-hmm. Improving their eating, as you well know, improving their eating, improving their sleep, improving their exercise habits. It's led me to a, a very particular rule that I've created for myself. So I, and you and I have talked about this since I was 16, I've started creating a list of rules or values for myself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we talked about that. Lessons that I've learned. I, I think I'm up to 26 now in total. So about one a year, some, a couple of lessons that just like when they really hit me as being really important, really meaningful helpful reminders for keeping me in the lane of the person that I want to be. I like I that. Sure I, I note it down. I keep a list of them. I have them so I can kind of review them from time to time. And, and one of the rules that I have for myself in talking about habits was I have a rule that I won't do something two days in a row that I don't want to become a new habit. So as an example, if I'm, you know, if Katrina and I want to celebrate something, if we want to go out for cocktails, if we want to go out for drinks on a Friday mm-hmm. night, I'm more than happy to do that. I love doing that with her. It's, it's an activity that we really enjoy, but I'm not going to go drink on Saturday. Gotcha. I like that. That's a really good rule. Right. If I'm going to splurge on my diet, if I just want to eat a whole large pizza to myself or eat an entire pint of ice cream or do something that's really out of the ordinary from what I would normally do, and it's something I really want, I'll allow myself to do it, but I won't do it again the next day. I'll get right back on track. Gotcha. I love that. I'm, I'm still in it. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Please do. And it, it's allowed me to have the, enough flexibility to still be able to enjoy some of those things that I know aren't great for me in the long term, mm-hmm. but it then gives me that extra accountability to get myself back on track, especially because it's one of those rules that I have for myself. Like I take those very, very seriously. And now that it's been indoctrinated and so it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of thought that goes before I add a new rule to that list. Like, I'm not just going to, just cause it sounds good. Doesn't mean I'm going to add it. Like I really have to sit with it for a while and see it play out in reality and make sure it's something that is genuinely something that is that important because it, I mean, when it gets added to the list, it becomes law. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's not, that's funny you say that is I was just I think on Instagram um a couple of days ago I seen this clip of Kobe uh where he was talking about how you know, once he made a contract with himself that was it he was like I'm not negotiating with myself so once I made a contract or I made a deal or I said I was going to do something it was done no matter what right and so like your laws kind of serve as that for you you know absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I love it. And I think it's just helpful for a lot of people. You know, one of the conversations that I have with a lot of people, naturally, when they join fitness coaching in similar ways to you and sometimes in different ways, they want to improve their health as the the road to something else, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I try to instill this in other coaches too, because I think it gets lost in the fitness industry that fitness is not the end. Fitness is not the end for just about anybody, even people whose lives are enmeshed in fitness, other coaches, yeah. athletes, whatever, the fitness is not the thing that they're after. It's something else. They either mm-hmm. want to feel good about themselves or they want to be able to accomplish more, or they want to have more confidence to do the things that will be meaningful in their life. Yeah. Right. And so when people work with me, inevitably we have these conversations about who do people actually want to be like, what, what, what is that for them? And a lot of people know very clearly what they want out of it, which I would kind of put you into that category more so of you have these ambitions, you have these goals, you have these desires, and you kind of know who you're growing into and you just want the edge to make sure that everything's moving in that direction, right? And then I have conversations with people who have no idea, right? They just know they're unhappy. They know they don't enjoy the life the way that it is and they want something better. So in these conversations with them of trying to discover what it is they actually want, it can get a little tough to, to obviously one of the beautiful things about life, but also one of the scary things about life is a, there's no playbook for 
there are playbooks, but there's no singular, this is the best playbook for you. Right. How to play the game. Right. So we have to make that all, we have to figure out what that is for ourselves. We have to write our own rules to the game, right? Our own scoring system, our own playbook. We have to figure all that out. But then we have to make it up as we go. Mm. Right? Everyone's making it up. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think that's one of the reasons why it's so easy, particularly for people who have achieved a level of success to feel that imposter syndrome. Because at the end of the day, as much as we've accomplished, we know we're still making it up as we go. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And so being able and other people to, to have them start to figure out, okay, what are our, what are my own version of these rules for myself? What are these values that I'm going to hold? What are the things that I deem important in life? How are the ways that I want to behave? How do I want to carry myself? How do I want to act in, in front of other people? What impression do I want to leave? Being able to actually start to define those specific things as I've done with my rules, my life rules, is how we help them gain clarity and figure out specifically what it is they want. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And so my playbook is my life rules. That's how I guide myself in the direction that I want to go. Right. It's it's the bumpers to my bowling ball as I'm trying to get a strike. <laughs> So, you know, you talked about ideas around being good enough and ideas around habits, but I'm curious if there are any other that you can think of, any other rules, whether explicitly you've laid out for yourself or maybe implicitly you just tend to do that you have for yourself. Yeah, you know, what you just said really triggered kind of like where I'm at at this very moment in life. When you talk about being goal versus growth oriented. I think that's ultimately what it boils down to. You know, um, a lot of people, even me, when I first came to you, I don't know if you recall this, not, I came to you. Yeah, I saw Brittany's success and stuff, but I wasn't even thinking about business at the time. Honestly, I was thinking about the fact that I uh, just proposed to my wife, at the t- my, my now wife, and I got to get married. And at the time, I was probably, you know, I would think I was like 287 or something like that. I believe that's where I weighed in that day. And I didn't want to get married at that weight, right? And so I had a goal. It really wasn't so much about growth or at that time, it was like, literally, I want to share some LBs so I can look nice in tux or suit in the, at a future date, right? And that's all it was about for me. And after you know, through reflection, I really realized that I would set goals and I would accomplish these goals. Like, you know, we, we hit our goal. Like by the time I was married, I was down to two thirty. I look great. Like a totally different person at that time. And I, you know, I would set goals. And then once I accomplished that goal, just like most people, you kind of fall off and you kind of go back to those old habits, start to slip back in or whatever the case may be. And then we all have these, you know, temperatures that we have in life. So we'll auto self-correct and we start veering too far to the left or right of that, direction. And, you know, I had to change my mindset instead of being so goal focused, being just grow focused, you know, ultimately growing into um, looking at my habits and the things that I was doing, not for goal sake, but for, for growth sake, you know, when you talk about ultimately what I want to be and uh, what I want to accomplish in life, you know, so when you, when you talk about, you know, what are you know, some other of those type of um, rules, you know, one of those rules for me is really stay growth focused compared to goal focused. So now whenever I do anything, I don't just think about like, oh, I want to accomplish this goal. I'm thinking, how is this going to allow me to grow to become ultimately the man that I want to be? Right. Am I doing this just for a short term gain? Yes, we have short term goals, of course. But this short term goal is ultimately is another step and my overall growth to who I want to be um, as a man and how I want to be remembered. So, you know, stay goal versus, I mean, growth versus goal oriented is another one of those. Really he, and now that you're talking about it, I remember the goal for your wedding now. It's, it's so yeah. cool to me. I remember <laughs> you sent me some of the pictures from your wedding and one in particular that I think I have on my website as a testimonial. I mean, you were straight GQ looking, man. Yeah, I, I, I felt great that day. 
I really did. Yeah. I was like, I lost like 57 pounds over that. It was six months. You know, she, she was like, all right, we, I, I proposed in August and got married in March, you know? <laughs> and then she sprung that on me three weeks prior. Like, Hey, you know what? I think I want to get married on this day. <laughs> I was like, all right, cool. But if I hadn't been putting in the work with you since September, because I, I literally met up with you within weeks after proposing, I wouldn't have been ready. And yeah, that was our first feat that we accomplished together. <laughs> and, and such an important one. Grow, you know, the idea of kind of being growth focused and growth minded is at the core of who I am and what I teach. Inevitably, we've talked about that in the past, right? This kind of idea of just building our, our skills and our abilities and just building up ourselves as who we are outside of any particular goal or ambition that we have so that we are just the best version of ourselves. And it reminds me of, and I don't know if I've ever expressed this to you before, but I know I have to others. One of my kind of my personal missions is I want to be the most interesting man that I can be. You told me that. <laughs> I think what I said is I want to be the most interesting man in the world, which that's a little out there. But... It's possible. Remember, you're capable of more than you think you are. <laughs> that is right. My <laughs> but it, uh, it and and that is kind of how I've the language that I've personally used to drive a lot of those decisions about what I want to do. Right, that's what's gotten me into a lot of the experiences that I've had that allow me to have. I always want to be that person to go a step further. When I walk into a party, I want to be the person that everyone's excited to sit next to. Cause I got all the good stories and I make people <laughs> feel good. And we just crack jokes and have a good time and whatever. And as silly as that may sound, just like in thinking about someone explaining that that's who they want to be. And it's not about popularity and it's not about notoriety or anything like that. More, more so it's about leaving an impression on people and creating an experience that leaves people feeling good and feeling inspired and feeling like they might also be capable or there might be more to life or there might be more out there that they're not giving themselves the opportunity to, to experience. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, it's so funny. As soon as you said that the first thing that kind of came to my mind, this is super random, but um, <laughs> I, I'm not a huge Beyonce fan. Right. But she has a song titled I was here. And it's my favorite Beyonce song because in the video, in the song, she just talks about how she lived. She made an impact. She made a difference. And she wants everybody and she wants to know or everybody to know that she was here. Right. In a positive way. And left the, left the world a better place than she found it. Right. And ultimately, you becoming that guy that you want to be the same thing you did you know you're gonna leave that impact and let people know that you were here you made a difference you made an impact you know 18 fitness makes a difference man but i'm curious to know which by the way beyonce was the first concert i ever went to <laughs> wow <laughs> how long ago was that this was it had to have been 2007 2008 it was 2008 Nice. <laughs> Never been to a Beyonce concert, but I'm pretty sure it's bananas because her fans are, they don't play. <laughs> it was right in the period of time. I don't think she does it anymore, but she started to shift. She went by a different name. She started to go by Sasha Fierce. Okay. That? Yeah, I do remember that. It was right that around era. that time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so, you know, that's kind of my personal mission statement is I want to be the most interesting man in the world. I want to leave this kind of impression on people when I'm around them, one of positivity, one of kind of introspection, one of awareness of, of personal growth and whatnot. And I'm curious if you have an idea of what your kind of personal mission is, as you think of being growth minded and, and where you see yourself. I want to make a difference in, in, in the world that we're in. And I want to really live this life because we only get one to the best of my ability. You know, I don't want to be a person who, you know, at the end of the day is saying, I wish I would have did this or I wish I would have tried that. I don't. So I, I do try and do a whole lot of things and I push myself and, um, and I step outside of my comfort zone regularly because that makes me feel alive. 
right? And, and ultimately, that helps me grow and develop into the man I want to be. So, assume you've seen at least some of the Fast and Furious movies. Yeah, for sure. I often use this as an analogy because it's such a good representation of it. As even though the most recent Fast and Furious movies have gotten a little bit ridiculous. Yeah, they they keep going further and further out there. Like they were in space the last one, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> and if you think back to the the very first Fast and Furious movie where they were just car thieves that stole VHS players, I'm pretty sure, or CD players. <laughs> like it was that was that was the height of what they were doing. But the interesting thing when I think about that franchise is I think about over the course of the last nine movies how much they've stepped up in everything that they've done right now. Of course, the end of the movie, they're fighting these mastermind villains and they're saving the world and they're going to space and they're doing all these crazy things. And in the beginning, it was just stealing simple CD players, right. And try not to get caught by the cops. But in each movie, they've had to go to the next level, right. They've had to go to the next level. They've had to do something bigger. Both the characters have had to do something bigger. Otherwise it wouldn't be exciting. Or and or the the producers and the directors have had to step it up or else audiences won't come see the same movie nine times over. Right. Right. And it makes me think of, you know, there's that that saying when it comes to experience that, you know, 10 years of experience isn't the same as 10 years on the job. Right. Because you could have one year of experience repeated 10 times over. Correct. And you're not actually growing. And that coupled with the idea that in my opinion, and this is kind of a very humanistic perspective, which is a perspective in psychology about the desires and motivations of humans, that we innately desire to see ourselves progress in some fashion, right? Our greatest motivation and our greatest sense of pleasure, as I'm sure you can attest to, Mikhail, is when we actually see ourselves making progress towards a goal, whether that goal is specific, win a 60 day challenge, get in shape for our wedding, achieve a certain business outcome, or if it's even just seeing ourselves as an individual progress closer to the ultimate goal that we have. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And so your kind of bravery to push yourself out of your comfort zone allows you to progress in a manner, just like in the Fast and Furious franchises, right? When they're going to rob a bank in Brazil, when they're on the run and they got the rock chasing them, trying to put them <laughs> in jail, right? That naturally is something outside of the realm of what they were used to. Absolutely. Right. But it's only when we can step outside of those comfort zones that we're really going to not only achieve the things that we want, because we are going to push ourselves to grow, right? We'll, We'll rise to the level of the expectations that we have on ourselves. And so if we can put ourselves in a position where there are higher expectations, now we have the ripe opportunity and the ripe environment to actually rise to those levels but then actually be able to experience most importantly, the sense of joy. Yeah. When we do something scary and we accomplish something as a result of it. Yeah, absolutely. And what's, and what's crazy is that a lot of times when you talk about that, it's uh, when you get to those destinations, I mean, I, I'll say for myself so far, they never really felt like how I thought they would feel. And the greatest joy for me has always been in the journey to get there. Yeah. It's so it's how can you, is there a specific goal that you've achieved where that you can share that where you didn't feel like you thought you would. Okay. Let's talk about the 60 day challenge, for example. Right. I I really worked hard and and I won that and um, you know, got propped out in lifetimes newsletter or whatever the case may be. But on the last day, when I went for that final weigh-in, i never forget it. I went to a swim aerobics class that morning with my wife and my mom. And I weighed in. I found out my results. And it was just like this whole past 60 days, I was busting my butt, working hard, trying to get here. And at the end of the day, it was over with, right? And now I had to mar- the next day. And I had to keep on going. So it wasn't like, oh, that was it. I had to keep on going, right? (laughs) So, you know, like the the high of it was all over and now I'm right into the thick of things, you know? So I think that's just how it is with a lot of things. Like we have these goals that we set for ourselves, we accomplish them, but life doesn't stop. It just keeps on going. 
So, you know, I was, I, that's an example where it just didn't feel like I thought it would. <laughs> yeah. You know, it makes me think of, I, I think you're right. There's this kind of facade of the happy, the happy ending, right? The happily ever mm-hmm. after, like we achieved the goal and that's it. There's nothing else. But then you're right. We wake up the next day and there's got to be something else. Mm-hmm. Right? Otherwise, we're just going through the motions. You know, it made me think about I was doing a lot of reflecting, not to get too ominous or dark or anything, but I was at the beginning of this year, 2022, was a bit of a rough start in my world in the sense that I, I got COVID on December 22nd. So I missed Christmas. I think you and I had talked about that at the time. Um, and then while I was sick with COVID, there were a couple of deaths in my girlfriend's family and in some of her friendship circles, some of her friend's family that she was very close to had passed away while I was sick. And so naturally in those types of events where we lose a family member, there's a lot of introspection that goes on. There's a lot of thinking. You start reflecting on a lot of things. And something that I was thinking of was this concept of closure, right? Because I think one of the challenges, again, not to get too dark, when we unexpectedly lose somebody is we feel like we don't have a sense of closure. Yeah. That person. But I think not only closure with other people is important, and that is reflected, I think, in how we live our life amongst these people, but also closure with ourselves, I think, Mm -hmm. is important. Like When we're in that spot of it being the end, whether we realize it or not, I think there's an importance to having closure in our life. And so for me, I've started since then to kind of reframe those ends. Like you've talked about, you get to this big accomplishment, you get to this big goal and you think that's it. That's over. I've won like time to retire. And you realize, no, that's not the end. There's other things that can, if we're not careful, I think it can be a little disheartening because we don't feel the way we expect to feel. We don't have as much of a high as we expected to have. And we have to figure out what's next. And that can be pretty daunting too. Yeah. Yeah especially given the length of time we've worked towards a goal, right? I know that was true for me when I was trying to lose weight for myself. When I lost that 80 pounds, that was literally the only mission that I had my entire life. If I wasn't at school or at work, you know, I was in my senior year of high school. If I wasn't at school or at work, I was in the gym working out. I was running. I was doing, I was working out two or three times a day. Like it was my entire life. I threw away my social life. I threw away all those other video games. I threw all that away. And it was just that. So when I got to the end of that goal, And I lost all the weight. I didn't have anything anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. That was my entire identity was achieving that goal. And now I had to figure out, well, shit, what comes next? Yeah. Right. And now the way I think about it, going back to that idea of closure is every goal that we accomplish, every milestone that we achieve, it's not the end. Right. Because the end is the end. Right. right? (laughs) But every goal we achieve, it's a moment of closure on that particular thing, right? Absolutely. So when we get to the end, I now have closure on that aspect of my life or on that particular goal that I wanted to achieve. I like that. And so that is, personally, that's allowed me to to not struggle so much with figuring out what the next thing is. Because, and it, it also, I think, is a little bit of a ritualistic thing in our minds to have a sense of closure on such a big achievement to be able to allow ourselves to move on to the next thing and kind of set that one aside. Yeah. You know, so that, I, that's what I started thinking of as you were explaining, kind of not feeling the way. Yeah. And it's so funny. Like now I'm thinking of more way, more things that just didn't feel like I thought they would feel <laughs> finally. <laughs> so I have one that's kind of the reverse. It's not necessarily, well, it's partially, I didn't feel the way I thought I'd feel when I achieved it, but also looking back, which you might be able to, to, have some experience with as well and and appreciate the view when i first started you know again i was 23 years old it was 2014 Uh, i had a year of experience in the coaching space i had zero business experience and at the time part of the reason i started my own company was i wasn't making enough money at the commercial gym that i was working at to pay all of my bills so when i started my company i was on food assistance i was on food stamps i was like bare bones scraping by uh, you know, I was sharing a, an apart, a cheap apartment with a, a former college roommate of mine. And I was just like making ends meet. And that partially was what led to that mentality I mentioned of if I wasn't spending every spare moment on this, then I didn't want it bad enough. 
right? And so gotcha. at the time I dreamed, I dreamed of having my own place. I dreamed of being more financially stable. I had a dream of just like having a car that I didn't, wasn't afraid was going to break down on the way to the gym. You know, mm-hmm. like that apartment I actually chose specifically because it was a five minute walk from the gym and I knew my car was going to break down at some point. So I did a little bit of thinking ahead and I'm like, when this breaks down, I got to be able to get to work. So I've been there. So that was <laughs> where I lived, right? And so now, and I look at, and I'm extremely grateful from where I am now. You know, I'm in a wonderful relationship with a beautiful woman. We moved in and bought a house together this year, right? Um, business is the best it's ever been. I have a reliable car that I don't have to worry will start in the morning. Obviously, I'm eternally grateful and I'm happy. And all of those things make me feel like I genuinely wake up happy every single day. That doesn't mean life. That's awesome, man. But I like, I genuinely like the positivity that I exude with every person that I work with is a genuine positivity because I genuinely love my life where it is now. Part of it's because I know that I'm still progressing and there's more to come. Right. And I Mm -hmm. like the dream of it all like you, but it's interesting when I look back, I kind of miss some of those early days too, Mm -hmm. where like there was nothing to lose. There was just finding it out. There was just the newness of it all, the, the adventure yeah. of it all like <laughs> that that's uh that feeling in the beginning when you feel like you don't have anything to lose uh it's it's one of my favorite feelings i'm because yeah. i'm fearless at that point you know like i i just go for it and a lot of times when you start to acquire things you get to a place of comfort um that kind of goes away a little bit you know you can still have it but it's not the same when you feel like man my back is against the wall and i have to make it happen yeah. you know um and kind of had the pleasure of taking on new opportunities where i'm right back to that space and i'm very happy yeah i was gonna, I was gonna say that's a change in my mind because you the interesting thing about you is in all of your ambitions and all of your hard work towards all these goals, you've done it. The thing that stands out about me stands out about you to me is the fact that you've done this with a family at home, wife, now two kids that in and of itself working a normal job is tough enough. Like how do you put yourself in a position to be able to take on all of these new challenges with as much as, as we've said before, as much as you have to lose now, or as much as is on the line is at stake at home. That self-belief I talked about knowing that you're good enough is how, honestly, you know, I, I'm at a place where it's like, I can do this. I'm going to do this. And, you know, I believe in God. I'm a man of faith. And I truly believe that the Lord will meet you you know, where, where your limitations start. Right. And so I, long as I'm putting in the work and doing those things consistently daily that I know I need to do to drive those efforts, then I don't have anything to worry about the rest to take care of itself, you know? So it's really just that confidence in myself that I can do it. Um, I truly, truly believe that. And that's what I'm, that drives me. That motivates me. Of course, you know, none of this would be really possible unless I had that support system, you know, so my, my wife knows where I'm at with everything. And that, that helps me a lot, you know, just knowing that she knows where I'm at. Yeah. She's a little, she's completely opposite of me, you know, and I probably drive, I'm not probably, I do probably, I do drive her crazy with how I am, but she, the proof is in the pudding every, like throughout our whole 10 years, we've been together and known each other. She, I always make it happen. And so this is no different. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting to hear you talk about your wife being so different than you because it's the same. Katrina's the exact opposite in many ways of me in the same respect, I imagine, where like thinking about taking the risk of starting a business and not having the certainty and like everything that goes into that is just mm-hmm. like that is no interest of her. Whatsoever. Absolutely. Yeah. But the thing that I'm eternally grateful for to her, and I'm sure you could say the same thing about your wife, is that she, even though she may not understand it, she allows me to be the person that I need to be to do it. 100%. Right. That's it. Yep. <laughs> that's huge. That's yeah. Huge. That, that's major. You know, even though that's not her necessarily, um, she never, ever gets in the way. You know, she, 
she'll she'll be like, hey, I already know. Like, <laughs> hey, go ahead, do what you gotta do. <laughs> <laughs> just make sure you take care of the stuff you, you know your commitments to the house we're good <laughs> it's interesting too i think you know there's definitely something in the early stages when your back's against the wall and you have nothing to lose you can be fearless but i think there's albeit a little different i think there's a sense of that even as you get further along and you do have more to lose whether it's a house or a car payment or family at home to support and feed or whatever because now there's more at stake if you don't yeah. succeed, right? It's a different kind of back against the wall. Now it's not just your back against the wall. You're fighting the world, you versus everyone else. It's your back's against the wall and your family's behind you. And you Correct. Can protect them and, and do all of that. And I don't know about you, but I've always found that I'm more motivated by my duty and obligation to others than yeah. myself. A and lot of people are like that. Well, I believe in my, from my experience, most people are like that. I'm one of those people as well. Um, you know, I, when I have people depending on me, I don't want to let them down. Um, and I, I, I like this. I call it leading from the front. So it's just like, you know, when that, I have those obligations where I'm like, hey, you're the person that's going to go do this. Then I make sure it's done. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> so it's definitely, it's a different driver, but one that I think can be equally as powerful and albeit less reckless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more calculated. And honestly, you know, just over these years, as you grow and mature and have more experiences, I've been blessed to have some phenomenal experiences on, on a professional level. So was, those tools are there, those resources, the network, you know, it's go time. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, you know, we've talked about a lot of different ideas and you've shared a lot of good insights in terms of being growth oriented, in terms of, you know, recognizing that you're good enough and kind of trusting yourself and, and getting outside of your comfort zone. And I'm curious if there's any other concepts or ideas, whether things you've stumbled upon in your own journey of self-growth or things in your entrepreneurial journey that you think directly translate into somebody being better equipped to succeed at their fitness journey? Two things kind of come to mind. Done is better than perfect. So, you know, when you talk about the fitness journey, like we may have, you know, you lay out a plan for us, right? And let's just say in that plan, there's 10 workouts or whatever the case may be. And maybe I don't have enough time to complete all 10. And so instead of saying, man, I don't have enough time to get my full workout and I'm not going to go to the gym today. Hey, if I got 15 minutes, let me go in and get 15 minutes worth instead of not doing it at all. So done is better than perfect. No, it's not that I do sessions that I wanted, um, but I still made a positive step forward in my health and fitness journey that day. Right. Um, and then another thing I would say is kind of similar to done is better than perfect is execute. Right. That's that's my personal word for the for this for the rest of this year, actually, is just execute. Right. And so if you make those commitments to yourself, you know, all of us that will work with you, we 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 pay for your service for, you know, so it's just like, you know, execute on that commitment that you made to yourself. Everything else to take care of itself. So just execute. You say you're going to go to the gym. You're going to work out this day. This is the plan. Execute on it. Execute. I love it. I love it. Done is better than perfect and execute on the plan. That is yeah. some sage advice. So one last question I have for you, Mikhail. And that is, I want to open it up to you to ask me any question that you want. Okay. So, you know, I kind of, you triggered me earlier, right? And I know some pretty interesting stuff about you and, you know, that idea that you want to be the most interesting man in the world one day. For those of us that are listening, what's one interesting thing about you that most of us don't know? Ooh, that is a great question. Naturally, I, I would feel compelled to share the running of the bull story or, or the sneaking into Sagrada Familia story or some of those stories, but I think I've told those a lot. And so I don't want to yeah. share them again. So I'm going to share one. So when I was in middle school, I was in the eighth grade, 13 years old. There was a, an event for eighth graders before they went off to high school called Portfolio Day. 
portfolio day was essentially a day of mock job interviews. Leading up to it, you had to create a resume for yourself. And then you had to list, they had a list of professions of professionals they brought in from the community to come in and actually interview you for their specific field. So you had to pick like three different fields you were interested in. And then over the course of the afternoon on portfolio day, you'd go do a job interview with, with each of those professionals. Okay. And then they would give you feedback on how well you interviewed and, and stuff like that. And it was this kind of mock job interview day to kind of prepare you for, for what was to come. And I remember my middle school at the time. So this was 2005, maybe 2005, almost 20 years ago. Wow. (laughs) Our school in particular had just been awarded a grant, a special partnership through NASA, which is kind of ironic. Right. NASA. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, uh, for, for listeners not privy to the inside joke, uh, <laughs> Mikhail at his company, his team name was called NASA. So that's funny. <laughs> but anyways, we were awarded a contract by NASA where they, they invested a lot of money into the school. And um, as part of that, one of, the, one of the careers that you could interview with was an astronaut. Mm. And it was a, a little bit more tough to get in. Most people, if you if there were too if there was too much demand for a particular profession, they had to give you like different choices, right? Because they couldn't have one professional interviewing the entire school of, of students, right. You know, so for this particular one for the astronaut, you had to write an essay onto why you wanted to interview with them, and then they selected three kids out of the school. And so I wrote my essay, and I don't remember what I said in it, but they selected me to to be interviewed by them. And I, I won't forget, his name was Scott Fitzgerald. It was a video conference. So it was a, like a Zoom call, but this was 2005. So things right. were different then. Yeah, it definitely big, not the same. It was that big tube TV <laughs> that they used to roll into the classrooms. The video, right? It was a big tube TV. I was in the classroom by myself. There was a big webcam on top of it that was pointed at me. And I just like sat in this desk cowering beneath this gigantic TV, looking at this gentleman who was, you know, based in Houston where, where NASA's headquartered. And he was interviewing me about it. Very nice gentleman. Very, you know, obviously knew that he was interviewing a 13 year old. And the thing that stands out about me about it is he asked me why I wanted to interview with him. And as most kids would say, and as I wanted to say, I want to say, because going to space sounds pretty cool. I want to go to space. But I was afraid at the time that everyone would say that. And I didn't want to be like everyone else. So I made something up and I said, oh, I'm, I'm interested in the design of the spacecrafts and how they can get it to go into space and, and that sort of thing. I'll never forget his response was, whoa, so it sounds like you're more interested in engineering. And in my mind, I'm like, no, (laughs) that's not what I wanted out of this. Like you could tell he kind of like, I won't say he wrote me off, but it was almost like a recognition of, okay, like I'm an astronaut. I go to space and you're interested about the spaceship design. I don't know anything about spaceship design. I just drive the thing. Right. And it sticks with me now as a memory because it, it's kind of one of those lessons that I learned of a kind of, I won't say I wasted an opportunity, but I wasted an opportunity to have a conversation with a, an astronaut that's been to space, which how many people get to say they're sitting down with someone who's been right. on this and ask them all the cool questions that I wanted to know. Like, does the earth really look that cool when you're in space? Is there really just a bunch of nothingness? How does it feel to be in no gravity? Like all those questions that, really interested me. I didn't allow myself to ask because I was afraid of just being like what he may think of me and what other people may think of me of just asking the simple questions, even if they were the questions that I really wanted the answers to. Yeah. They're your questions. Yeah. And so that memory kind of starkly stands out to me as kind of the lesson of ask the questions you want to ask, you know, I like it. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely, I love it. <laughs> and, and, and taking it a step further, because I think another thing important too, and I was talking about this uh, with Chris, the coach that works with me at 18 Fitness, was the importance of 
making your goals known to a degree, but making them known and making people know, making people aware of what you're trying to achieve. Because you'd be surprised how much help you can get and how much direction you can get when people actually know where you're trying to go. But if you're afraid of what people think or, or what my, how it may sound or whatever, and you put on this facade of what you think people want, then you're going to get the wrong things in your life. Yeah. hundred percent, man. Right. If you are pretending to be somebody else, you're going to become that person and you're probably not going to like it because you're pretending. Yeah. And it's so funny you say that. I, I, um, like my mom, I was just telling me when I was younger, she would say, Hey, you know, when you, if you want to approach someone to do anything, um, you know, make sure that you're actually doing it or like have something invested into it or the case may be. So that way it inclined people to help you more. But, you know, I still believe that to, to this day. And what I've really noticed is that people overall are inherently good and they really do want to help other people. And people are much more inclined to help people who are trying to help themselves. So, you know, if you are doing something, if you want to do something, don't be afraid to ask questions and and reach out for other people to help because you know it's a lot of it's it's typically the people who you do not expect they're going to be the ones who really help and bless you in life and that's 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 really been my experience so i agree with you wholeheartedly there that's such great advice i want to end it there mikhail thank you so much for for being on the podcast with me today thanks for having me bro thanks for tuning in if you feel inspired by this story please share it with a friend If you'd like to book a free discovery call to talk with an A-Team coach, head to the episode description or visit us at ateamfit.com. That's A-T-E-A-M-F-I-T.com. We'll see you again soon.